we started with in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and uh, of course that's where it starts at uh, but creationism evolutionism is uh, big in the subject today we have this great big thing out there about separation of church and state and how it's uh, totally been uh, misconstrued and how the what the writers of the Constitution and everything and the Bill of Rights how they've been uh, changed what they intended and our founding fathers were believers they believed in creationism but the rewrite of history would have you to believe they were uh, deists or they were uh, like new agers you know and things like that um, Thomas Jefferson and all these guys have totally been distorted in the uh, rewrite of our history and uh, the thing about it is that uh, evolution uh, in the United States especially took a big big boost uh, when uh, Darwin in England on the HMS Beagle made a two-year naturalist trip and uh, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution was uh, the world was ready for it they were just waiting they'd been looking for it for a long time because uh, they've been trying to get out from underneath the accountability to God that's what the evolution thing's all about we're we're trying to be convinced in fact it's almost it's almost succeeded that evolution is good pure true science and it's really not a religion it's not a philosophy but it is a religion and it is a philosophy and uh, it takes a lot of faith to believe in evolution and uh, it has founding fathers and uh, it has a, a code book just like uh, Christians we have the Bible they have their book and uh, they have their leaders and we have our leader God and uh, so it's naturalism things just randomly happen versus God is a designer the master craftsman who created it and brought it into being and what's at focus here is just who are we going to believe are we going to believe what man says or are we going to believe what God says well, in the first place if you're going to believe what God says you have to believe in the God and you have to totally believe in the God you can't partially believe in him you can't believe that part of what he inspired and left with us is true and part of it's not and you can't believe that part of it can be taken literal and part of it's just sort of uh, uh, mystic or it's based on uh, uh, some type of uh, a Babylonian flood epic that was adopted by the Jewish people and written into their history so they could have a legitimate history and that type of thing that's that's what the liberal uh, persuasion tries to convince us of is they try to convince us that uh, a lot of the Bible is really just mystic cultism and it was adopted from the area in fact there are some that go as far as to say the Ten Commandments was adopted from Hammurabi's code Hammurabi was a Babylonian king and he had the Hammurabi, the code of Hammurabi and it said you not kill, you will not steal, you will not do all these things and so some of the liberals come along and said well the writer, whoever the writer was of the Ten Commandments they just adopted that from Hammurabi's code then you come to the worldwide flood and the worldwide flood uh, they say well there was a, a gigantic flood one time on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers which flooded the whole area and so there was uh, local heroes that had boats that rescued people and so this epic was told time after time after time and supposedly the uh, the deities of Babylon the gods little g-o-d uh, rescued all the people by these boats and things and so that got adopted as a a Babylonian flood epic and then the writer of the book of Genesis whoever it was according to the liberals uh, came along and says well this is just a rewrite of the Babylonian flood epic so they borrowed the flood from the Babylonian flood epic in Exodus they borrowed the Ten Commandments from Hammurabi's code and they just kept borrowing all these things and they had all these writings and they put them together and it become to be known as the Bible and the Jewish people says we're now a nation they were just wild people out in the desert coming from the 40 years in the wilderness and they went in and they took over the land of people that were living peaceable and they killed their wives and their children and that was the conquest of the of the uh, land you know when Joshua took them in 
And so they say how barbaric this God would be. You know, this, this can't be a real God that would allow these desert wild people who's been living down in the Sinai Desert to come out of the desert and kill all these innocent people and take their lands and their buildings and their grain storage and their vineyards and orchards away from them. What kind of God is that? See, so, but why could it not be the opposite? Why could it not be the Babylonian flood epic is a distortion of the flood? In other words, the flood stories out there. Did you know that, that the flood, the, the great flood is uh, in the Indian culture here in America? It's in the African culture. It's in the South American culture. It's all through the European culture and Asian culture. In all of those, you get back in the real ancient histories of those countries and those areas, and you'll find there's a hero story about a great flood that flooded a large area, but there was a hero who saved the people and the animals. You see, the farther and farther you get away from God, the more and more you distort his truth. Just like in Central America, we, we find in South America, we find all these fantastic temples and cities built up high in the mountains or on the plains and these pyramids and all these wonderful systems and they had water systems and, and irrigation systems and actually air conditioning systems even without electricity. And they had uh, 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 places where they could observe the stars and they could read the stars for seasons and all kinds of things and measurements. They had great knowledge. What happened to that knowledge? Why do you go find those places abandoned? But living around those places are people that live in the jungle or the areas around it and they're, ab they're primitive type people. They're barbaric. Sometimes they're headhunters. Sometimes that they're uh, they totally disintegrated where they just rely on what they can hunt and find. All their history and language, written language, was lost in everything. Why? Because in all these centers that we find, these ancient cultures, there's always an altar there somewhere for human sacrifice. And when these societies, after the flood, and after the Tower of Babel, and when people scattered, and before the ice cap melted and brought the water up and shut us off into continents, people had already spread back out after the flood into South America, North America, Africa, Asia, and everywhere. And then the ice caps were melting and the water was coming up and it shut us off into continents. So these people all took the story of the creation and the flood with them. They had it in their history and it was handed down. But the farther and farther they got away from God, the farther and farther it became distorted until finally they fell into idolatry and finally into human sacrifice and then their civilization failed. It was no more. But the remains of their civilization, they're still sitting out there for us to look at right now. All these gigantic temples and these ancient cities scattered all through Central America, South America, and Africa, and India, and China. They're all over the place. And nobody seems to know how they did what they did. It's because man used to be a lot smarter than he is today. Believe it or not, we think we're getting smarter. We're not. Look at some of the things that the people in the past did without machinery and without electricity, without great earth-moving machines and all that. You look at your pyramids and these temples. You look at that uh, temple uh, city that's built up at 14 to 18,000 feet down in South America. How in the world they got those stones up there and built them like they did. You know what? Only thing that our modern-day people who don't want to cede responsibility God and God's people and knowledgeable people are very smart, you know, being God's people. The way they try to do it is, well, evidently, there was some kind of mystic thing or there were some visitors that came in flying saucers and dropped off and helped them to do it and they could levitate things and that's the way they did it. In other words, they're more willing to believe in flying saucers and extraterrestrials than they are in the fact that people were smarter and when they were closer to God. They made the right decisions. They built these gigantic cities. They had the know-how. You know, it's my opinion that when we look around society today and we find people with beautiful voices that are born with beautiful voices, that's a remnant the way every one of us were, was in the garden. I believe that before the fall, every person had a beautiful singing voice. When you look around, you see some outstanding, beautiful, handsome people. Women are said to be beautiful. Men are said to be handsome. 
And, uh, but anyway, you find some of, and you find some of us, our nose is too big, our ears are too big, our face is not exactly straight, you know. And we tend to get fat and we get older, we get wrinkled, you know, quicker. Some people just don't hold beauty. And they're born beautiful and they, they just tend to be beautiful and handsome. I think that's a remnant from the Garden of Eden. It's still in our DNA for some people to be beautiful. Because everybody was beautiful before the fall. There are some people who have a mind, they can just add up figures faster than calculators and computers can do it. You just start calling off numbers, no matter if they're four, five, or six digits long, and you'll call them as long as you want to, and as soon as you finish with the last one, they'll tell you the answer, and you can be adding it up on your computer as you go, or add machine, and they've got the right answer. How in the world do they do that? That's a remnant of the Garden of Eden. Some people can look at a book and just run their finger down each page like that, and uh, you can ask them questions about that book, and they'll tell you what page it's on and what part of the page it's on, and they'll quote it for you. They got photographic memories. I believe everybody had photographic memories before the fall. I believe everybody had all kinds of talents. They were musical. They were beautiful. They were talented. They had all kinds of uh, abilities. They did not need computers. They did not need electricity. They did not need all the things we need today. See, we're getting so fragile, we need everything to substitute for us. How, just how good are our memories today? I mean, if we had memories like people used to have, we wouldn't need uh, these uh, discs that you put in those machines and store stuff on. we just remember it. We'd have to never worry about a fire or tornado destroying it, would we? It's right there. I believe that all the good things that we look around us today and all these abilities and everything, I believe everybody used to have them. And since we fail, there's still a scattering of that in the population worldwide. But then we've fallen, so we're getting more fragile. We, we absolutely have to struggle to stay alive 70 or 80 years. Now, I used to, I didn't concern myself with that at all. 70 to 80 just was, man, that's so far out there. But it's not so far now. I'm a lot closer than that, and I am that other than it. But we get older. Why do we get older? You know, medical science cannot tell us why we age. And they're looking for all kinds of things to see. Why do we age? They think they're onto something. They found a chromosome that has a, like a tail on it. And they, they, try, they tried to picture the fact that that tail gets shorter as you get older. So they're going to try to figure out some way to keep that tail longer on that chromosome so we won't die. In other words, man is always out there trying to get around the fall. Trying to get around the flood. Trying to get around the Tower of Babel. Trying to get around the promise made to Abraham trying to get around Mount Sinai, and last and foremost of all, trying to get around the cross. In other words, you know, we studied that chronologically. We went right through chronologically, every bit of that, how all that was looking toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and he came, and he was crucified and buried and resurrected. He raised himself back, reinstalled himself in that physical body, resurrected and ascended on high, and he said, he's coming back. Be ready. See, we studied that story, and this fall we're going to start right in again, and we'll probably start in the intertestamental period a little bit, just set the stage for the birth of Jesus Christ, and we'll proceed. But right now in this creation and evolution thing, it boils down to the fact, where is our faith? Where is our faith? Do we really believe what the Bible says, and do we believe what it says without being influenced by commentaries? Bible dictionaries, Bible encyclopedias. Now, I have all those. I have a massive library. But I'll tell you one thing. That the first place I go is right there. And that's where I stay. If I understand it, and it's confirmed somewhere else in the Bible, then that's confirmed for me. The Bible interprets itself. You don't need a commentary. You don't need a big library, massive books. I only use those library and those massive books and everything for teaching purposes so that I will know what's there. So when students talk to me, I can say, yes, that is what R.K. Harrison says in his introduction to the Old Testament. But I want to point out to you, his view on verse such and such in Genesis. Now let's just go there to Genesis and read that. And also, did you know in Exodus it says so and so, and over here in Samuel it says such and such, and believe it or not, in Romans it was confirmed. And so trace it through the Bible, and I say, now, I personally believe that Mr. Harrison, you know, he's got a nice theory there, 
but I don't, it will hold up when you let the Bible interpret the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. That's all you need. And, you know, King James is a little confusing sometimes to us American English people, but now we have the NIV, we have the NASB, we have all kinds of versions. I have no problem with those. The King James is a version also. I use the King James. I've always used the King James. I will always continue to use the King James. But I'm not a King James only because it is a translation. The NIV, I know people's on the translation committee for the NIV. I know what their philosophy was. The philosophy was, if it's stumbly and hard to translate, we'll take a vote and the majority will win because we want a Bible that is easily read by Americans in American English. The NASB, they were a scholarly committee. They said, what we will do in the NASB, when we get to an area where us translators cannot agree, we will agree on a direct translation from the Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, and we'll leave it there no matter how confusing it is. And that's the reason why in the NASB, you can be reading along, and it's just as nice and understandable, and all of a sudden, it's just like you went from I-75 to a gravel play road out here in the middle of the boondock somewhere in the middle of somebody's grazing field you know it's just like the interstate ends and you're out in the middle of a field somewhere not even a road there and then all of a sudden you come over and know and you're back on I-75 again and see yeah, there you are so what do you have to do with those areas you just have to say well if those brilliant scholars cannot agree and they didn't disagree they just can't agree so they agreed just to do the straight translation and leave it. And that's the reason why the NSB's got a rocky road. The King James, the reason it's confusing to some of us, it, seem, it sounds like it contradicts itself in some places, is because in the Old English, some of the words in American English today have exactly the opposite meaning that they had under the Old English. I mean, the exact opposite. Like, I'll give you like the black and white. If it says in the King James today, if it says black, Back then it meant white, even though it was the word black. I mean, it doesn't, that's not a real word example, but uh, that's the way that, uh, some of the confusion arises. And uh, so just understand that uh, the, the uh, King James is a good translation. It is worthy. The NASB is worthy. The NIV is worthy. They're all worthy. Now, of course, now one that calls itself a translation that's totally unworthy is the New World Translation, and that's done by the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, they took the King, and they put it into a translation that they call the New World Translation that all it does is just takes and distort the King James to their theology. But if you know your Bible, you can use the New World Translation to totally refute them. Use their own distortion, their own heresy, book of heresy, and you can actually, if you know your Bible well enough, you actually can cause them to have to close their mouth. Just like that. And uh, now, let's, let's come back a little more. We're just laying groundwork here. You must believe in God. You must believe in what God has left written for us. You know, that's his testimony. You know, the last verses of the Gospel of John says, Why? If everything was written about God that he's done, the world itself would not hold the books. In other words, this, this world, this creation is not big enough to hold the books where all God has done. You know, what we have recorded about God in the Bible is very little. Very little. But we know as much about God as we need to know. But we do know that the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, says that in the beginning, that says when, it says that there was a beginning at one time. But before that beginning, there was a God. In the beginning, God, Elohim, divine sovereign creator in the Hebrew, created bara, bara, to bring something from nothing. He created. The subject is embedded within the verb in Hebrew. Bara is a third masculine singular cow perfect, if you want to conjugate it and, and parse it and do all that. That's immaterial. What it is is that word created is the word he created. Who created? This Elohim did. Elohim created. What did he create? He created the heavens in the plural and the earth. Now, uh, we discussed this a couple of times. Why God would delineate all the rest of the creation under heavens, and then he would come along here and say earth. And it's because the earth is the center of the creation. Now, I did not say the center of the universe. 
Even though there's some people that are proposing that, even though the sun goes around, I mean the earth goes around the sun and the sun moves in our galaxy and one arm of our galaxy and there's actually thousands and millions of galaxies in our universe. But the whole point is, God stated that he created everything else and earth. And he put earth out here all by itself. And the reason he did is because the rest of the verses, what did he deal with in the creation story? He dealt with the earth. And he told us what he did on the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. And he gets down to the fifth day and he has land animals and fish, ocean animals. And he gets down to the sixth day. Uh, I'm sorry, he had the birds and the uh, fish, I believe, on the fifth day. And on the sixth day he did land animals and he did man. And when he created man, if you'll recall, if you'll read your scripture there, it says... God said, let us, let us. Who's this us stuff? Elohim. Elohim here in the Hebrew is the plural. And it's a divine plurality. It's a three-in-one type plurality. In other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were present. And because he said there, this, this Elohim, this he created, this bara, it says right there that uh, let us, us, the plural pronoun, create mankind, not man male, not man, you know, sex wise, but mankind, Adam, mankind. Let us create mankind in our image. Our image. That's what God said. Our image. And thus he created man, male and female. See, and it delineates male and female. Eve was created on the sixth day just like Adam was. Some way or another we've got in our mind that God created Adam. He had all these animals and Adam was living on earth and Adam got lonely and, and he was wanting to know where his mate was and God finally, oops, I must have made a mistake and, you know, uh, brought Eve into being. That's not the way it is in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, let us create mankind Male and female in our image. And it goes on to say, and he created man, male and female. Now I know it says that Adam was naming all the animals, but this is still on the sixth day. And uh, you know, say, well, goodness gracious, how could he name all the animals on the sixth day? Still had time for God to create even all that. It's not that the days were longer. I don't believe they were. I think they were literal days. I think when God said a day is a day, is a day. He didn't need a sun, moon, and stars to tell him how long a day was, right? He planned how long a day would be before he created the first day. God knew how long a day was. He didn't need a clock to tell him. didn't need a sun. We're the ones who rely upon the sun and clocks to tell us about days and nights and things of that nature. Uh, let me just throw a quick one in here very quickly. Remember in the creation account when he said he created a sun, he created the moon and the stars. What did he say the sun was for? A light at day. What did he say the moon and the stars were? Light at night. Well, how come the moon's up at daytime sometimes now? Well, right there is an outstanding example of the fall and the flood. In other words, this occurred as a result of the flood. It occurred because of the great chaos that earth went through during the flood. And as a result... We are not in synchronization any longer. And we have some nights now that are very dark and black because we don't have a moon up there to give us light at day, at night time. And it's a reflection of the sun's light. You've been out at night time before with a full, brilliant moon with no clouds. There have been no clouds particularly before the flood because clouds carry water and carry rain. And there was no rain before the flood. See, we've, we've got to... We've got to believe the Bible. We've got to believe the author of the Bible. The author of the Bible is this Elohim, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that created something from nothing and this something was the heavens and the earth and the earth was his centerpiece and man was the centerpiece of the earth. Therefore, we come right back to the fact it's God, man, and land. That is the divine plan. The creator God created the land and he put man on it and he wanted to have fellowship with man. He established relationship with man in that Adam and Eve were created in untested holiness. But he created them in his image so that they would have choice 
and they chose to follow the dictates of their own mind and conscious under the persuasion of evil, which of course was the Satan who was now uh, had uh, gone inside the serpent and was tempting them. And so they made a choice, and as a result of that choice, they failed. Now this is a this is a crazy teaching right here, and I don't know I don't know if I've mentioned this before or not. But you all think long and hard before you make any comments about this, okay? But we do not believe, today, us Baptists believe in eternal security, right? That once saved, always saved. And uh, also we don't believe that after you die, you get a second chance or anything like that. You know, the, the Luke 16 account of Lazarus, the beggar and the rich man, and Jesus telling the story convinces us all that. Have you ever thought about the fact that Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were basically what we call today saved? But they lost their salvation, did they not? And they regained it. But that's the only two people. Now remember, that's a special case deal. And you can't apply that anywhere else in the Bible because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, therefore we're all born in depravity. That's called the imputation of Adam's sin. And therefore we all have to make a decision to accept this free gift. But see, Adam and Eve, they had a relationship, they lost it, and they reappeared the relationship. But God knew what he was doing because that was a special case there because they were divinely created and they were created in a state of untested holiness. So don't think about that one too long because it doesn't apply anymore. That was a one-time thing, Adam and Eve. Well, we see we have these verses and it says uh, right here that uh, he created the heavens and the earth. Now let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 uses this same language. In the beginning, just like Genesis 1.1 1, 1 does. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning. And the word was, and the word with, with, and the word was. In other words, it was with God, and the word was God. In other words, the word it's talking about there is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is identified here as being God. And when was he the same as God? In the beginning. And it says all things were made by him. And this hymn refers back to the word. And uh, this hymn is the word and the word is the same as God is with God. And the world was made, you know, in other words, by him first, by him. And uh, so we have in John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus Christ, the Word, is God and was present with God and also is the Creator. In other words, the world was made. And then let's just talk about a little bit then. Let's, let's, let's see, well, who is this God? This God who is Elohim, the divine sovereign creator of Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the plurality. You say, does God ever appear in the Bible as a singularity? Yes, but in the Hebrew, the word is El. In other words, like El uh, Roe, the singular God who sees all. El Rapha, the singular God who is the healer. El Nisei, the singular God who is my banner that I follow after in, in stages of warfare and things of that nature. He's the, the, the great captain of the armies. The, the, the sabbat, sabbata, you know, the, the uh, armies, the captain, leader, that type of thing. And so he has there in the singular, in El, but in Elohim, it's the plural, plurality. And so it's saying right here, that Psalms 139, very nice psalm of 24 verses, six verses each devoted to uh, all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, and all-righteousness. Just a beautiful psalm. And... Uh, this very first six verses says that everything that can be known is known by God. God knows everything, past, present, future. There's not anything he does not know. And you read those six verses, it'll tell you what he knows. So you may want to read them sometime. This creator God is also omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. It says that if you could travel from one spot to another spot as fast as light can travel. Where you left, God was present, and when you get there, God's already present in the other place you could get if you could travel at the speed of light. 
So God's everywhere all the time at the same time. And also these next six verses says he's all powerful. All power comes from God. There is no power except the power that is owned by God. No one has independent power no matter who they are. No matter how powerful they are here on earth, such as some of the dictators we've had and some of the people who really we have called monsters like Hitler and Stalin and Mao Zedong and some of these uh, Idi Amin down in Africa. All these dictators who have killed so many of their own people and everything. They think they're powerful, but they're not powerful. All they have is some limited power because of being a dictator and having the army under their control and power. And you say, why would God allow that? God allows consequences of sin to occur. That is one of the major teachings of the Bible. God allows consequences of sin. Now, he does not put the penalty of a father's sin on a son. But he will allow the consequences of a father's sin to fall down upon the son's head. That's a major teaching. You look at the Israel. When they would transgress and find themselves in sin, who suffered? The whole nation. That was set up in Deuteronomy 28 in the chapter of blessings and curses. And so uh, they were told that if they're disobedient, the whole nation would suffer a famine. It would suffer a pestilence. It would suffer warfare. And finally, if they remained disobedient long enough, everybody would go into exile. Now you look up at the time when we studied when they were put into exile, there were some very good people there. Look at Daniel. Look at Azariah, Michelle, and Hananiah. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, the pagan language. And uh, so, uh, uh, look at uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Look at Habakkuk. These were righteous men. But when that exile occurred, they all suffered right in that same thing with the unrighteous. And when that third of the population died in Jerusalem under siege by Babylon, you know that all third of those weren't just all wicked people. Some were innocent. Some were women. Some were children. Look at a third that Nebuchadnezzar's army killed when he broke into Jerusalem. Many of them were innocent people. They had not been into idolatry and sin like the rest of the nation had, but they died right along with the guilty. And look at those put into exile. We just named some by name that were put into exile that were great men of God, but they went into exile also. Taken from their homes never to return. Daniel never did return to his home. And he was of the Davidic line. He was of the royal family. But the last record we have of him is uh, the episode about the lion's den underneath the king of Persia. Because Persia had conquered Babylon by this time. And Daniel had continued as an advisor even to the Persian king after having been an advisor to the Babylonian king. And so we see that the innocent do suffer along with the guilty. Just like the tornado that we had. Innocent, guilty, doesn't matter. Tornado takes whatever a tornado takes. Hurricanes do the same thing. Earthquakes do the same thing. Now it may be that God, you know, is trying to get our attention with all the brush fires and the floods and the tornadoes and the earthquakes and things we seem to now be experiencing in the United States. They'll try to tell you, oh, we just have better reporting now. No, it's not just better reporting. We actually have more of these things. And... Uh, so it, it's consequences. And uh, remember we talked about from the first, what happened to all these great civilized nations? How come their buildings are left, but they, they don't occupy them anymore? They couldn't keep that system going, and they moved out into the jungles and the deserts and places, and they existed out there sort of as pagans or barbarians or jungle people. And, you know, you, we think that cannot happen to the United States, but we keep on sacrificing human beings like we're doing. You know, abortion, that's all in the world is doing is we're sacrificing uh, children so that we can have a higher standard of living, so we don't have to worry about these children. They're not planned, you know. They're not in our plans. It's too expensive. We can't afford them, so we abort them. And that's a form of child sacrifice, and I personally think as a nation, we will have to stand accountable for that as a nation. Not as just the individuals performing the abortions, but as a nation. Because that's a national sin, and we have to be accountable to it nationally. Well, 
So here we're dwelling on this God here, and he's all powerful. Satan has no power except God gives it to him. Now what book did we study which shows that Satan has no power except what God gives him? The book of Job. So we have a whole book in the Bible that tells us that God will temporarily give Satan or certain people power. He gave Nebuchadnezzar the power to come down and lay siege to Jerusalem and break through the walls and to tear the temple down and to burn the city. God gave him that power. God gave the power to Joshua and those followers to go march around Jericho and he caused the city to fall down, see. And so God gives what power others have. Now these last six verses, God hates sin. The reason God hates sin is because God is totally righteous. He, he desires that we be righteous. We could not be righteous on our own. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But, see, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be white as snow. And like we said before, when God the Father turns to God the Son and says, how's that Bill Pop doing? And God the Son, Jesus Christ, says, oh, he's absolutely perfect. He is lily white clean. Because I'm a believer, see. I've accepted the gift. And God says, that's good. But Jesus Christ then, you know, when it relate between me and him, he says, oh, but you got some... You may be lily white and clean to God because I'm your advocate and I'm your priest. But you know, you got some things you need to work on, you know. And uh, so, but you're, you're redeemed. You have, you have the relationship. But your fellowship could be so much better with me if you would just put more time in that prayer or that praise or that, that uh, devotional time, that Bible reading, that... Uh, that uh, just just sitting and being quiet and and meditating, you know, and and that type of thing. You could move so much closer to me. See, well, see, that's fellowship. But Jesus Christ is always God the Father. That yes, I have relationship, and that is my security. See, for the eternity that uh, that I live in. You know, all of us are eternal in this room. Everybody's eternal in this room. Nobody in here is going to cease to exist. That's uh, annihilationism. That or nobody here is going to get reincarnated as somebody else. That's Hinduism. Uh, nobody in here is going to uh, be relegated to a purgatory that you can't get out of because of sin you committed, like committing suicide and you died in the act of sin, so therefore you can never obtain heaven, see. That's Catholicism. See, all these diverse beliefs have grown into major world-class religions today. Oh, look at that first one when Satan says, oh, you eat of the fruit of this tree, you'll become as gods. That's Mormonism. Started right in a garden in Eden. See, and that's the way you need to know your Bible. You don't need it to get in a fight between a Baptist and a, and a Jehovah Witness. You need it for the security of yourself. And you need to believe the Bible. You need to study the Bible. And because it is God's Word, it's what He's left with us, that in the beginning He did it, and He was present before the beginning, and Jesus Christ and God and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same, and they're equals, and the, they have all the knowledge. They're present everywhere. They're all powerful and totally righteous. And then if that's not enough to clarify it, look at Colossians 1, 16, 17. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 is talking about Jesus Christ. It says, by him, everything was created. In heaven, in earth, the visible, the invisible, it was created by him and for him. By him and for him. Why do we exist? We exist by the pleasure of God. In other words, to be in his image, so therefore we can have relationships, so we can have fellowship, so that we can be eternally in his presence when he uh, does away with this heavens and earth right here. This heavens and this earth are going to be totally destroyed. You go to Revelation 21, 22, and you'll find after the great white throne of judgment, and all the unbelievers of all time become before God, Elohim, 
and the white throne of judgment. And they are judged on the basis of their works because they can't qualify to get into eternity in the presence of Christ because they did not follow Christ. So God's going to judge them on the basis of their works and not one's going to be found worthy of entering into the uh, presence of God. All are unworthy and therefore they are told to leave the presence of God. And there's only one place they can go. You see, after, when the heavens and the earth are destroyed, there'll be a new heavens and earth for us believers. But there's this lake of fire in outer darkness. And that's where the beast and the false prophet were thrown at the end of the tribulation. And that's where Satan is thrown after he's loosed for a little while, after the thousand years when he's out of the bottomless pit and he's loosed for a little while, and he tries to take an army up against God, and God throws him in the lake of fire. And then God judges all the unbelievers of all time because they've been in this holding place called hell in this cross the great guff. That's where the rich man was speaking from when he was talking to Abraham in reference to Lazarus the beggar in, in uh, Luke 16. That will be emptied. They will be judged. And they'll go to the lake of fire. God will destroy the heavens and the earth. Why? Because they've been contaminated by sin. You know the promise to us. See, we've been told that we need to be redeemed. That's the first thing we need. We need to be redeemed. That's justified. That's our salvation. Then we need to grow in our sanctification to become more Christ-like. And then we're looking forward to a glorified body. That's when our spirit, our eternal spirit, is united with a glorified body. That's the resurrection. There's no soul sleep. That's the resurrection, see? We're joined with our body. And we go to be with the Lord now if we depart this body. James 2, 26, Hebrews 9, 27, all kinds of verses here. And Corinthians also uh, tells us our state that if we die. Well, you see, we have this new heaven and new earth and the glorified body. And the glorified body, it says, we will live totally outside the presence of sin. In other words, that means we will not in any way be anywhere where there's ever been not even one sin. So this earth has to be destroyed. Heaven has to be destroyed. Why? What did Satan do? He committed sin in heaven. So that's the reason why the heavens and earth have to be destroyed. And that shows you that there's a, there's a, I can't call it a creation, there is an existence there is an existence, and I, I can't even describe it or limit it because I'm, I'm, I'm a fallible, created being, and I cannot think for God or act as God. But we exist within whatever that is, and that's where God is, and that's where he operated from when he created us in the heavens and earth. And so we will just be set aside into this, whatever this is, you will destroy the heavens and the earth. They will vaporize. And I'll show you in a moment how heavens and earth can vaporize very quickly. Just that quick. The whole thing can vanish. And uh, so then he'll create a new heaven and earth and there's where we will exist with him for eternity. Outside the presence of sin. So the, uh, our justification, our salvation is to remove the penalty of sin from us. Our sanctification that's growing in Christ's likeness is to remove the power of sin over us. And our glorification is to remove us from the very presence of sin. That's a beautiful story. I like it a whole lot more than there was nothing and then something came from nothing by accident and random and then it was all none living and over billions of years all of a sudden one cell came into existence somewhere the, non, the living from the none living and from that one cell without a nuclear membrane, then another cell came with a nuclear membrane. There was millions of those. And then these went on being one cells without nuclear membranes. And these went on being one cells with nuclear membranes. And then they divided into multicellular. So we had one cell without a nucleus, one cell with a nucleus, multicellular. Multicellular went on to become fungi, <coughs> which did not know if they were plants or animals. And then we got plants, and then we got animals. And billions and billions of years, all by accident, all by random, all coming from chaos to more and more complexity. See, that's what we've been led to believe is that we're, we're evolving into more complex creatures because creatures, animals, and that we just happen to be at the top of the heap right now uh, because we've out evolved everybody. We learn manual dexterity, eye, you know, eye and hand and thought process 
and we could speak. That's what's supposed to, we're supposed to evolve that, that put us top of the heap. Well, if that's true, if evolution has been occurring, evolution is still occurring, right? And somebody's going to out-evolve us someday. Because we out-evolved the apes and the monkeys. Somebody will out-evolve us. Maybe we're already evolving. Ah, yeah, this was a favorite little deal here not too many years ago, but you notice they, they only use it for political correctness now. That's this issue of race. If you believe in evolution, we are evolving into coscoids, mongoloids, and negroids. And that means if we're evolving into three different kind of races, evolution always, always has one who does what? Out evolves the other. It's superior. So you see where your white supremacists or your black panthers or your Ku Klux Klan get their ideals from? Evolution. We are a master race. We're out evolving those blacks and yellows. We're superior. Survival of the fittest. Evolution. Survival of the fittest. Kill them off. See? And survival of the fittest. What's wrong with killing your children that uh, are going to be you know, mentally retarded or physically handicapped? What's wrong with killing them? You're just helping evolution now. The problem is abortion's killing the best. That's who's having the abortions. The ones with the healthy children. And uh, the ones who have good genes, you know, as we want to call them good or bad. There's no such thing as good or bad. It's just a consequence of time, uh, radiation, and consequences of sin long time ago, many, many uh, hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and or thousands of years ago. We'll talk about all that as we build this up. But right here, by him all things consist. You know what that's saying? That says that Jesus Christ holds this chair together. He's holding my body together. He's holding everything together. How, how can we say that? Let me show you just a little quick course in chemistry. You will like this. Let's take chlorine. Now you've heard of chlorine before. You've heard of table salt before. Table salt is sodium chloride. Sodium, which is an explosive, and chlorine, which is a poisonous gas. You put them together and you got table salt. I will never forget my lesson at UK on uh, working with sodium. They brought these blocks of sodium around, and uh, in the instruction for the lab, they said, break off the smallest piece possible and put it in a beaker of water and cover it with a watch glass. Well, I was working at a night watchman for Standard Oil Company at the time and going to school at daytime, and so I heard, take, I'm going to deliver you a piece of sodium, and then I must have sort of dozed off. Now, I didn't hear that part about break the smallest piece possible off. And I woke back up in time to hear and put it in a beaker of water and cover it with a watch glass. They brought that block of sodium to me and we we're supposed to work all two hours lab with that one little block of sodium. Well, I thought, man, this lab's going to be over quick. This is simple. I took my watch glass of water, put the piece of sodium in it, put the watch glass on it and blew up the lab. And so uh, it, is a, it is an explosive. You used to have to store it under kerosene. And chlorine gas, I got chlorine gas in the Marine Corps, and I know what that'll do to you. And, but you put them together, and you got table salt. Well, let's look at this sodium, or chlorine rather. Chlorine, if you look at a table, a uh, chemical table, it'll have 35 and 17 on it. Well, these are things like you don't really need to know. Atomic weight, atomic number. This tells you the number of electrons, which have a negative charge. It tells you the number of protons, has a positive charge. And you, you subtract this one from that one, and that amount um, there would be 18 and that's the number of neutrons and they have no charge. Now I want to show you what I'm building up to right here. Very quickly here in the last minute or two. Let's just put this other picture of... Now let's put a picture of chlorine up here and I've drawn the thing out to show you what this represents. You see elements have a lot of empty space in them. All it is is these little positive charged particles and you have 17 of those in there. If you were to count those 17 plus charges then I have these 17 negatives out here whirling around the orbits. I have at least three orbitals there, suborbitals. And the negatives are out here running around, the positives all clustered together. Now what bothers you about that? Do you ever play with magnets when you're young? What's positive charges do? You try to put two positive charges, north poles together in magnets, what happens? They resist. You can't, or you put two south poles together, what do they do? 
They resist. They shove apart. In other words, you can't put these north poles together, these positive charges. How in the world do I have all these positive charges in every element? Gold, silver, mercury, iron, copper, cobalt, carbon, fluorine, fluorine, doesn't matter what it is. All those hundred and some elements are made like this. All the positive charges clustered together in the center of the atom. Those positive charges being held together. You know, the scientists have been looking for these. And they, they, they theorize there's something holding them together. And they've already proposed a name for them. They call them gluons. You know, electrons, protons, neutrons, and gluons. They've never found these gluons. Because Jesus Christ is the power that holds all those positive charges together. You know what would happen if Jesus Christ just suddenly would say someday, he'd say, I don't desire to hold the protons together. What would happen to you, me, everything physical, material? Gone. To nothing. That's where we came from was nothing, and that's where all this is going to return to. Well, this is the introduction, so I hate to leave you with the fact that uh, it can all be destroyed so easy, but the point is in Colossians 1.17, it says what? It says that Jesus Christ is the power that holds everything together. So next week, we'll start right in on that uh, lesson sheet there, and we'll go right down the line on that, okay?